Ξεκινάμε. Άμα θέλει, ε, να είσαι κοντά στο μικρόφωνο. Ε, δεν ξέρω αν θα τα καταφέρουμε, αλλά θα τη συνάγω. Για να έρχομαι λιγάκι. Ούτε μπορώ να είμαι με το μικρόφωνο, ξέχασα. Θα με ακούσει ο κόσμο μια χαρά. Καλησπέρα σα. Good afternoon. I'm afraid we will run uh, late, so we have to manage the time wisely. I will have to skip a few of my slides. And um, we have a small problem. The problem is that all the information I'm going to give you, I'm afraid you are not familiar with. So we need an extra effort. We're going back to basic biological processes. Please try to recall whatever you know, you know just to make things move quicker. So we're talking predictability. And during this presentation, we will go through myogenesis. That means the generation, the formation of muscle, digestive capacity, and hormonal mechanism. Why is that? This is, we're skipping things. This is why the ultimate goal of aquaculture is the production of high quality product. What is the product? We're selling muscle. At the end of the day, this is the final product. Although in Mediterranean species we're not filleting, again, muscle is the major product of aquaculture. So we want to have to determine all the important events during ontogeny that uh, will affect muscle, quantity, and quality at the end of the day during the ongoing stages. Why muscle is the most important thing? because it comes for something like 70% of the body mass. That's why I'm saying you're saying muscle at the end of the day. And has a very uh, defined structure. So we have muscle fibers. These are the muscle cells that they arrange in a very specific way. And you see here, this is a section of a CBAS, okay? And you can see that they are arranged in sections, and each one of the sections called myomer. In Salmon, for example, this is very evident. You can see it even at the final product. And you all know this picture, you're familiar with this picture. We have red beads uh, lined up with um, white connective tissue, and actually these are the boundaries of the myomers. So we are building this throughout hatchery and on growing stages. This is the most important thing. This is what you do during the process. Everything else is tuned towards this as a final product. You have to pump up muscle fibers with lots of proteins. This is what you're doing. You start this early at hatchery and you continue that throughout the growing stages. The structure of the muscle, as we said, is well, we have we have this uh, certain structure. We saw this in, uh, in sea bass and salmon just in the slide before. But basically, the cross section is divided into two different uh, bits. We have the major, the majority of the muscle, and this is white muscle. It's fast, it's glycolytic, and it's not meant for marathons, as Jorgo said before. At the edges, we have small bits of red muscle. This proportion differs from species to species, and this has to do with the lifestyle. For example, we have lots of red muscle in tuna, that is a species that swims a lot, long distances, migrates, and so on, and needs to sustain a very good swimming uh, velocity, while we have very, very little in Mediterranean species like sea bream and sea bass. So basically, we're dealing with white muscle here in our species. Muscle is formed in three different phases. We have embryonic myogenesis, stratified myogenesis, and then mosaic myogenesis. Embryonic myogenesis starts at the egg stage. After fertilization, we have the formation of different tissues, among them muscle. During that stage, the embryonic uh, myogenesis, we end up with muscle cells that they are small, and they have just one nucleus. This is the first picture we have from muscle, and this is how they are when they hatch. After hatchment, what happens is we have the multiplication of all these muscle fibers in a very arranged pattern. This is why we call it stratified hyperplasia. So every time we have a new stratum added, 
and this happens in the apical areas of the of the of the larvae, the dorsal and the ventral part, and this is the stage that dominates the hatchery. Okay, so during hatchery we have a hatch larvae embryonic myogenesis. Throughout, we have stratified hyperplasia. That means lots of fibers arranged in a very precise pattern. And by the end of the hatchery stages, just after metamorphosis, we switch to another mechanism, which is called mosaic hyperplasia. And this is going to stay for the rest of the life of the fish. Each stage is affected by different factors to start. And the important thing is that during the early life stages, we have the determination of the muscle cells. We mean myogenic progenitor cells that they will be activated throughout the life of the fish whenever we have favorable conditions for growth. So basically, in this first, the initial stages, we need <coughs> to stimulate the generation of many, 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 as many as possible of these myogenic cells, which can later on, with nice manipulation and way, we can activate and then increase, accelerate the growth of our, of our fish throughout the different phases. And we're saying that because in fish, unlike what happens in us, in humans, muscle is built throughout their life. If we give them the chance, they build muscle fibers throughout their life, okay? So this is the important event we have to keep in mind. Because the determination of the myogenic cells and stratified hyperplasia takes place during hatchery stage, you can understand how important it is that all this is manipulated in a way that gives the potential, increases the potential of fish to grow later on during the ongoing stages. What happens during this process? We have, as we said, the myogenic cells. The myogenic cells, they look like any other cell. You don't have to know about this. They look standard cells. But during myogenesis, all this changes. What happens? We have the fusion of many of these cells in one very, very big structure. This is the biggest cell that exists. Let's play this all the way down. So this is the, the biggest cell that exists in the body of the fish and can accumulate nuclei continuously. This stage that we have the creation of new muscle fibers, or this process is called hyperplasia, and this is the formation of fibers, hyperplasia, canonical nickelexia. Later on, we have another process that dominates the formation of muscle, and this is called hypertrophy. What happens in hypertrophy? Existed fibers created in the previous stage, they keep accumulating protein and they grow fat and fat and fat. So you can imagine that the muscle is like barrels that you can keep, they keep increasing in diameter as you feed the fish with proteins and as they can accumulate proteins. So after all, at the end of the day, what we call growth and what we're interested in is the synthesis and accumulation of muscular proteins, proteins in the muscle. That's what you do. You pump the fish so it can synthesize and accumulate as much protein as possible in the muscle fibers. And what type of protein they are? They are proteins of the contractile apparatus. And probably you all know of mycin and actin. This is very basic uh, biological knowledge. Muscle fibers is <coughs> an important indicator of growth potential. And this was manifested 25 years ago to start. And then it was used for studies in aquaculture extensively. What the first study was back in ecology, okay, in the wild. And what happened was different fish that they have different, different final size in nature, they were examined for the number of muscle fibers they formed. And there was a clear linear correlation between the final size and the the final size, sorry, and when they stop producing muscle fibers. 
So that was a strong indication we had from the very beginning, and everybody started looking and measuring muscle fibers after that. There are several studies that they come from ecology, like this one, for example, where we have Arctic char in an Icelandic lake. Four different morphs. So this is exactly the same species. But each morph, four of them, they have different final size, and you can see the comparison in the photograph, and they inhabit different strata in the lake. The final size is proportionally correlated to the actual number of muscle fibers they create throughout their lives. And coming to aquaculture, this was even more evident with transgenic fish, transgenic um, Arctic sharks, genetically modified. It carries the common growth hormones in. And we can see here the age control, the size control, and the transform. That means that here we have the genetically modified. And here is Arctic char with the same size with the transform, but different age. This is younger than this one. And he here we have the age control. They are exactly of the same age, but of course they are of different size. Here we have accelerated growth. What's evident, very, very clear, is that in transform, growth hormone, genetically modified salmon, what happens is that we have m much more, many muscle fibers at the end of the day that give, manifest this accelerated growth by the help of uh, growth hormones in. So, muscle fiber is the thing to see, to look at, and there are people that they devote days and days and days and years of their life because it's a very laborious procedure when you, you have to go fix, cro uh, cut, and, and measure muscle fibers. You cannot do that during production, okay? This is not a practice to be incorporated in production, that's for sure. But for research reason, we get, we get lots of, inf of information, and later on, we try to replace this laborious and, um, and very expensive, let's say, technique with some others that they give us more or less the same result. Here is what happens with Sibrim. In Sibrim, we have, these are the initial stages, we are hatchery. It goes up, as you see, to 60 days. This more or less metamorphosis are uh, at 20 degrees average. And you can see here that we have a very rapid increase in the number of muscle fibers in the first days, up to 35 days post hatch. And then we have a stabilization and something changes. What changes? If we, these are real sections and we try to uh, overlay the color so we help the presentation. And as we move from blue to pink, we have an increase in diameter. So at the beginning we have lots of fibers, we have lots of fibers, but they are small in diameter, they are small in size. As they grow older, they stop producing fibers or they slow down okay, considerably this, uh, this process. And then they devote most of the effort, of the growth effort, to increase these uh, this, this, uh, fibers in, uh, in size. In other words, at the beginning, here you see the correlation <coughs> with length as increases in length. And at the beginning we have a rapid increase and then a stabilization in the total uh, number of fibers. However, the fiber area, which means how fat they grow, keeps increases continuously. Hyperplasia goes down, hypertrophy goes up, and hypertrophy is going to dominate the later stages of Hatsby. So basically, you are dealing with different processes that you can manipulate as Hatsby managers. This is an important thing to remember. At the beginning, you have to pump the fish to create fibers. Later on, you have to keep in mind that, that switches, okay, and uses most of the feed, uses most of the energy through towards hypertrophy, that means to grow the fibers bigger and bigger. Is it easy to keep the hyperplasia? Looks like there are different factors that we can use to increase hyperplasia or to manipulate hyperplasia towards hyperplasia. And temperature is one of those factors. For example, you see here, 
there are two different studies for SIDAS. <coughs> and in the first study, there were fish subjected to 19 and 15 degrees. And they were tested at hatching and mouth opening to reveal that hypertrophy was higher for 19 degrees. That means that we had bigger fibers with higher temperature, but hyperplasia did not, did not differ. Conclusion, early stages, temperature is not that important for hyperplastic processes. They do not produce more fibers, at least for sea bass, with higher temperatures, but they grow them bigger at higher temperatures. These are early stages. We are at hats and mouth open. What happened later on? 25 days, after 25 days from huts, the cross-sectional area of the white mass at 19 degrees was mainly associated with higher proliferation. That means hyperplasia. So we have windows, but we are sensitive. It's more or less the same logic as the one presented by George. We have windows in endogeny that we can interfere, we can change things, and we can produce a better result at the end, but this cannot happen at any time during hatchery stages, okay? We have to know which are the sensitive periods we can really make a difference for our product. And this is one of these cases. Playing around with temperature, we can see difference. This is another study with CBAS again. Here we have three different temperatures, and you have white muscle total cross section area. This is a combination of number and diameter, okay? At the beginning, there was no difference when they sampled. They start, they sample, and so they had more or less a homogeneous population that they then subjected in 13, 15, 25 degrees. And we can see quite big differences when at 102 days after transfer to ambient temperature, we can see that we had at 20 degrees, the warm fish, they had a smaller cross-sectional area compared with what happened with the smaller temperatures. However, there is not a linear relationship here. Like between 13 and 15, there was no difference. Between 13, 15, and 20, there was a big difference. So it's not like you raise one degree and you make a difference. It's not like you raise three degrees <coughs> and you make a difference, okay? When we are talking sensitivity in autonomy, you have to define the stage and really the, the increase or decrease in, in temperature that makes the difference. This is for Sebas, but we had the same, there was the same result for, uh, for Salmon, for example. Here you can see salmon that was subjected in low and high temperature during the early stages. And then you can follow the increase, the growth, actually. This is fiber number, how, how big they grow, when they are transferred in cages. So they are, we are quite big. You can see here the length, anyway, they are 60 centimeters. They are really big fish. And fish that they were heated, they, were, uh, they grew at warm temperatures during, the, during hatchery they do not perform as well as the ones that they grew in low temperatures <coughs> in the early stages when they are transferred to cages. That means that these early stages, they can really make the difference. We, most of all cases, we have irreversible results because we have such a quick pace in endogeny that we cannot really go back. We cannot reverse the effect. And we have to be very careful how much we invest in these early stages to get the result later on, really later on. Fibers, fibers, fibers. The problem is that we cannot keep measuring fibers. No way. All the labs that they do that, they have people that they do it all the time, they have technicians. It's very, very difficult and takes time to get the result, even if you are in production and you are willing to pay, you won't get the result the time you want the result, okay? Because it takes lots and lots of time. What we can do, we can look for molecular markers that we have a very good correlation with muscle fibers. Good candidates, myosin. Myosin is the molecule that fills up, it's a protein that fills up the muscle fibers. It's a very strange molecule because 
it consists of six different peptides. So we have two heavy chains and four light chains. And the strange thing is that, or useful, depends how you see it, that the expression of these peptides, they are under developmental, hormonal, tissue-specific, and thermal regulation. This is at gene level, okay? If you don't understand, just interrupt me, and I'll give more explanation on that. We know already from salmonids, for example, that some heavy chains, they change with nutritional factors. If we feed them more fish meal, or we feed them less plant, uh, plant origin protein, or during different conditions, <coughs> they, they respond very well to nutritional levels as well, and also, some of them, they were included, or they, they, they were considered candidate genes for a marker assisted selection program in salmonids. What we found here, working with one of those, which is this one, this is the myosin light chain 2 in Sibrin. We pick that one because it responds very well to thyroid treatment, and it's the one that bites calcium and actually regulates all the velocity, all the spin that the muscle can contract. So it, we consider this a good candidate. And we realized that in Sibrin, <coughs> it is expressed very, very early in development. That's one thing. And it's not only that. Follows the white muscle development and marks the newly formed fibers. So small fibers, they express lots of this myosin light chain. Bigger fibers, they stop. Small, newly fibers means hyperplasia. Big means hypertrophy. We have a pattern that matches very well with the hyperplastic areas of the developing muscle and then seizes um, expressing during hypertrophy. After metamorphosis, we can still find it in very, very small cells that they reside between the big fibers, and here you, here you can see really big fibers, but then you, can, you see black dots in between, and these black dots, they are myogenic cells. These are the cells that we want to have, and we want to activate whenever we want to see our fish growing. So the expression of this gene matches the pattern of early myogenic cells. So th these small cells are cells to grow, to grow, but in the future? They are not activated at the moment, okay? They are just waiting for the right thing. However, we realize that in Cyprin there are two different isoforms. And we call them myosinlatein A and myosinlatein B. You can follow the, the dark line and the dust line. What we see here, we see that we have a molecule that appears very early in development, we are hours post fertilization, not even huts. Here it's first day after huts. So this part is the embryonic myogenesis, this phase of myogenesis. And we can see that we have a very rapid increase in expression of this gene. And then it remains high throughout stratified myogenesis. Why? Stratified means lots of new fibers. Marks the new fiber, so we expect you to see it high. And it is high. What happens later on? Entering metamorphosis, and this is the beginning of mosaic myogenesis, and mosaic is this. We have, this is like mosaic, isn't it? It has a mosaic appearance. So we have fibers of different diameters, and in between we have very, very small. That's why we call it mosaic uh, hyperplasia, this, this phase. We have a down regulation of myosinylate chain A, it decreases. And at the same time, myosinylate chain B increases. Basically, this is a moment of replacement. What is the replacement? Is when muscle becomes really juvenile and starts a different phase in growth. A is the embryonic form. B is going to be the adult form. What we need that? We need that because it matches very, very well with counts of fibers. So we have a molecular marker that can replace the old marker, which is not cost-effective, okay, and cannot be applied in production. 
Δεν ήταν πριν ένα σύγκριτς φάνος, δεν ήταν. Μπακ. Ναι, στην Is the stage where we have this transition from the one type of uh, growth to the other type the same as we uh, define metamorphosis in respect to the other characters? Yes. So, we have a match. We have a match. We have a match. And uh, it's, it's the same from, even from an um, endocrinological point of view. It's exactly that. And basically, you can see that sifting depending on manipulation. For example, we had this experiment here. What happened? We had Sibrin, same single bats, okay? One day eggs from a small broodstock, and they were stocked under two different conditions. There was intensive versus mesocos. We know that mesocos, they like it, they are happy, they grow bigger, they grow faster, and so on. What we realized, this is A, this is B. At all time points, this is day spot hats that we sample, mesocosm fish had a higher expression of our molecule. Expected. They are bigger in size anyway. And intensive, lower. Except one point. What was that? 18 one days. 81, you are post metamorphosis, you are in juvenile already. You have a form phase. And we can see here that at this stage, intensive is higher, at fish grow at intensive conditions is higher compared with mesocosm. And this is why. This is because this fish was late in metamorphosis compared with that one. So we had a later down regulation, and actually at 21 days, they are not at the same stage at all. These were metamorphosized later, we had a shift, and this shift can be manifested even with our gene expression. But this one, where they were quicker, so at that stage, they don't need the embryonic form anymore, and it's at lower levels. This is the opposite exactly with B. This is the dominant adult form. Green is mesocosm, and when it levels up, it levels up. And at 21, 81 days, it's higher than so basically we have this inversion, and this inversion was stable even six months later as the cases when we sampled, they, they were exactly the same. After that they were transferred to cases, we sampled six months later. B in intensive lower compared to mesocosm. So there was an imprinting. Early stages determined an expression pattern that followed the fish throughout the cage stages. Bigger in size, higher expression of mycelium light chain B. Smaller, higher A. What we say here is we need the ratio. This is just one thing. We've run this in several ways. We run experiments with plant proteins, with fish proteins, just to see on nutrition, whenever we had a difference in growth rates, we had a difference in ratio between isoform A and isoform B. Ratios that favor B means that we have a fish that grows quicker and better after the hatchery stages, after metamorphosis. At hatchery stages, we need A, the higher the expression, the faster growers we have. Okay, and they reach metamorphosis earlier as they proceed. Is it a, a predictor or a descriptor? Okay, we see that it correlates well with the growth the fish have now, at present. Could we use it as a predictor of the growth of the fish? Well, th this is the, why I have six months later here. We predict that mesocos because of the ratio and because they risk metamorphosis and because they express light chain B at higher levels compared with the other, they are going to grow, have a higher growth potential later on. This is why we went back and they sampled six months later okay. after the transfer. So and we, we still have the same. Describes and predicts. Hmm. At a certain point, just it describes. But you can have very good, very good prediction for later on. Muscle growth, and that was growth, 
such, is affected by several environmental and nutritional inputs. This is a, a fuzzy network created by Johnson in one of his uh, papers. What we try to do, we stick in two different um, ways that they affect, in two different biochemical paths that they affect the growth of muscle. And the most important is food. So we have gut that accepts all the food ingested and has to process it and make nutrients in the form available for muscle growth. This is what we care about, okay? We have a muscle growing and we want to pump fuel nutrients in this growing muscle. The prototype of digestive tract for, for, uh, for fish, this is the adult digestive tract. For our fish, at least that they have stomachs, it's, we start with the esophagus, peristaltic movements, they, they lead, uh, it leads the food ingested in the stomach, and here is where digestion starts with the very gross action of pepsins. They are enzymes produced by the stomach that they break out down proteins in very big chunks to start, okay? Very, very big chunks. And this is an acidic environment. So pH here is very low, and after that, we have the key of, uh, of this uh, grossly digested food going through the pylorus and the anterior intestine that includes the pyloric city. Here, the environment changes completely, and we have pH that raises to start, and we have the pancreas that produces and uh, secretes lots of enzymes but we are going to deal with this food in a very delicate manner. A series of, uh, of proteases, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, carboxy peptidases are produced by the pancreas, together with lipases, amylase, and esterases. But at the same time, the intestine itself produces lots of these enzymes, amino peptidases, V and tripeptidases, and saccharidases. Plus, we have all the microbes, the gut microflora, that they are there, and they also produce their own stuff, which is lots of stuff. They produce cellulases and ketinases that they are not produced by the fish to start, but they also produce everything else. So this is <coughs> an important factor in the development of, uh, of fish during hatchery stages, because if we achieve, we're not going to have data here today, but we have lots of strains isolated by the gas, from the gas of uh, sea bus, European sea bus here, and it's amazing how much of these enzymes produce and how quickly they could digest food for, in favor of the whole digestion procedure for the fish. So we have the food moving down the intestine, and at the same time we have things happening. Chop in small pieces, absorption of the small pieces, okay? All of them, they do a different thing. For example, trypsin and chymotrypsin cuts in the middle. We have big proteins and they cut big chunks, okay? Elastase and carboxypeptidases, they, they do very fine work because what they do, they remove amino acids from the end of the peptide. And in this way, they, they produce very small molecules ready to be absorbed by the intestinal epithelium and available for growth. So we need all this. And we, we have to be aware <coughs> of what they do and how they have to be manipulated to increase our efficiency, <coughs> digestive efficiency. The problem for hatchery managers is that they don't have this digestive tract to work with. They start their work with a very primordial digestive tract, which is just a tube, a line, a straight line, straight tube and doesn't include any of these enzymes. In most cases, we have protease activity, means trypsin activity, there before mouth opening, but nothing else. Everything else appears later on. So during hatchery, you have to keep in mind that you're feeding babies like mothers do with breastfeeding. They need different, they, they need a continuous adjustment in feeding 
because during hatchery stages, the digestive tract keeps changing. Here we, you have a more or less a comparative presentation of what, of the major events, okay, for uh, for bus and brim. This functional stomach here, you might not agree, and I can tell you why. We all know that we have a, fa a stomach, stomach structure somewhere here at 25 days, but this is not fully operational like it's going to be in the adult stages. It's only by metamorphosis, more or less, that we have the mature, the mature digestive tract with all the glands operating and producing everything. Okay? So, digestive tract keeps changing. In size, in morphology, okay, in the capacity to accommodate food, in the capacity to process food. And during the development, the fish larvae gradually develop the capacity to produce pancreatic, intestinal, cytosolic, and plus border enzymes to deal with all this food. That means that we have three different sources of enzymes. Pancreas, intestinal, cytosol, and the brush border. And all of them, they are activated on different phases during development. And this is not something that happens without manipulation. We can manipulate all these procedures. And here you see, for example, the levels of the different enzymes, trypsin, leucine aminopeptidase, alpha amylase, and gamma glutamate transpeptidases. They are of different source. And you can see how much they fluctuate during development. And this is something that you have to consider when you feed your larvae. You cannot feed this larvae in the same way you feed this larvae at this stage, okay? You can see the differences. It's, and if you combine all of this information, basically you have to adjust feeding as frequently as possible to achieve the best possible result for your larvae. In separate what is the change? The quantity or uh, the quality? Both. Both. And you can, and you can condition both also. You can make them like something or produce an enzyme more compared with another one. We see it later on. It's the same with Sibri. Here you see the three major. We have trypsin, chymotrypsin 1, chymotrypsin <coughs> 2. And black dot means there is a lot or there is none. So up, <coughs> up to mouth opening, there is no chymotrypsin 1. Chymotrypsin 2 appears around about then, while we have lots of trypsin. So more or less, we have a, a, a similar pattern between brim and buzz in terms of time of appearance, but then their activity is completely different. Can we use all this digestive information from digestive enzymes to tell something about the larvae, the quality of our larvae? Well, there are different studies. I picked this one. I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Sea bus. I tried to go for studies of Mediterranean species. This is sea bus of different, we have two batches, different spawning quality. This one is low quality, high quality, so we have LQ, high Q. Low quality was low number of larvae and low percent of hatching, okay? High quality, high number, and high number, high percentage of hatching. So this is the starting material. Then they were um, uh, subjected to two different feeding <coughs> regimes. So we had one control, fed at libido, and we had a restricted regime. What happened? Restricted feeding led to higher survival in both cases, high and low quality spawning. So if something is not good at birth, at hatching, that means that it's not without any fate. We can improve the fate if we can manipulate. We know how to manipulate feeding, survival, and growth at the end of the day. So we had a higher survival in both spawnings with restricted feeding, as well as higher growth per day. And the interesting thing is that measuring trypsin and chymotrypsin in those groups, all four groups, digestive proteases differed within between the spawning quality, so high quality, low quality, and you can see differences. Control restricted. 
control two days after winning. So we are more or less two months, uh, sorry, we are more or less uh, 19 days. Here was 19 days. We have 2.6, we have a higher trypsin activity for the low quality spawning compared with 1.17 for the high quality spawning. So these fees were doomed for a manager, okay? This hatching rate, this number, probably it, were, it would have been discarded. However, if you feed them in the right way, you can have very good performance, okay? And sometimes you get better performance compared with the high quality spawning. And also, there was, <coughs> we had a ratio between trypsin and chemotrypsin tell us the difference between that. So all these good survival and good growth per day was reflected to the activities of these two digestible enzymes, trypsin and hemotrypsin, mm -hmm. as a ratio. Is this always the correct way to go? Well, you can change things around. You can moderate. You can condition the fish to produce more enzymes if you want to do that. But first of all, you have to know what sort of activities you have. And most of the time, you don't even bother to measure any of this. So you have a routine farming, and you have to, uh, you have the slightest clue <coughs> what sort of digestive capacity your lab has. If you had, you could change things around. For example, here it's again CBAS, and we can see that changing the content of fish meal in the larvae, we have a change in trypsin activity. It's exactly the same batch, but they were treated. They were fed different things. In this way. We had the induction and the increase in activity of trypsin, and that means a higher digestive potential, compared with those that we were left with very low, uh, very low nutritional, uh, if we can say that, value of, fish, of, of it. It's the same with phospholipids. Many of you, we are really concerned about phospholipids and larvae diet and how the fish is going to deal with that, the larvae, how much we need, what sort we need, and so on. But basically, what something you don't know is that there are two different enzymes that deal with all these diet and phospholipids, and you can condition the larvae to accept different phospholipids. And here you can see that we had the increasing phospholipid content, increase the weight, but also increase the activity of the enzyme that deals with this phospholipid. So we can end up with feeding schemes, small feeding schemes, that they can accelerate the production of the enzymes we need for a short period. And this is something that the fish is going to use later on, again during hatchery. You need that even for short periods, and we have the acceleration. <coughs> and then you can condition the fish to accept different diets and push energy uh, use in a more efficient way. Our studies, indicators. This was run in collaboration with In Vivo NSA. For aquaculture, this is Bernacqua. Okay? Bernacqua aquaculture belongs to In Vivo <coughs> NSA. Two different <coughs> diets were tested. Let's say X and Y, experimental diets and two different schemes, feeding schemes were applied. One was just this diet from nine days post-cuts up to 45 <coughs> days post-cuts, simply. The other scheme was more regular for hatcheries. So there was Artemia feeding up to 20 days, then there was a co-feeding up to 30 days, and only the experimental diets between 30 and 45 days. What we did? Fish were monitored at 30 and 45 days. And also, between other things, we measured the activities of different enzymes. So we have trypsin, chemotrypsin, the ratio, uh, carboxybutyrate A and B. We just wanted to see if we have any match. What we realized, we realized that final body weight was correlated with trypsin activity. And also we realized that survival and total mass, which is basically this uh, 
parameters measured at 45 days at the end of the experiment was correlated with trypsin and trypsin hemotrypsin ratio. So this idea we got from CBAS, we transferred it again in these experimental diets, and it works. It looks like we can trust trypsin and chymotrypsin as gross indicators, gross indicators of growth potential, final growth, survival, and total mass at, uh, at hatchery stages. Same for post-winning diets. See us again. Four diets or commercial, A, B, C, D, coding names. Here we had feed fed, uh, fish fed between 60 and 100 days of hats. And again, we had them, we measured a series of digestive enzymes. This one at the end is supposed to be very important. It is considered the indicator of the maturation of the digestive tract, how mature it is, how ready it is to work. And we realize again that feed B was the winner. And it was the winner because it had a higher final weight, as you can see here, and had a very, um, a very, that it had the, the higher specific growth rate and also had the most improved FCR. This winner diet coincided with the higher trypsin, uh, trypsin activity levels and more or less we had a rating that was correlated very nicely with final weight at the end of our trial. So, Trypsin and chymotrypsin, although they are gross proteases, they are there to do a big job, and this is reflected in the capacity they have to give us predictions of performance or correlate very well with performance. <coughs> Predictability is largely quality, but also you have some other problems. And the problem is that you have most of the time to predict how well a larval feed is going to perform for your larvae. There are not many ways you can help that. You can keep feeding larvae and measure how much they grow. This is what you usually do. So in most hatcheries, we have numbers, we apply, we use this feed, we got this performance. We apply again and we had another performance and so on. But this takes time and most, and gives you no prediction when you have to make the decision what you're going to buy. Here we come with a, with a proposal, which is a, an assay called in vitro dietary protein digestibility assay. And basically it's a technique that was used for human food uh, production. It was developed in Kalsberg uh, factory in, in Denmark back in the 80s. After that, it was used in uh, animal uh, production, some point in fish, but never for life. So we went back and we optimized this methodology for use in larvae uh, feeds. And it's, it, it appears to be very sensitive and able to predict or tell us what the performance is going to be for larvae feed even before we feed them in larvae. For example, we have questions we can answer. What is the level of dietary protein digestibility of two different feeds in European sea bass and 20 uh, degrees water temperature? Okay? You have to compare two. It does. We end up with these complicated diagrams. I know that you don't like them. I know that you have problems to read them. But if you take a closer look, it's very, very easy. What is up there is better. What is down here is worse. Okay? So, sifting towards there is better. That's one thing. But it, it, gives us, it gives us very detailed information of the performance because with all these diagrams, diagrams, we don't get just one value of digestibility, of protein digestibility, which is the usual thing for in vivo digestibility measurements. Usually you get something that's 93%, 85%, and so on. Yes, but under what conditions? How much does this say? Okay? What was the temperature? And how is going to take to change with temperature, for example? Here we have an estimation of how digestibility is going to change with food consumption. So we have high digestibility here and then drops very, very quickly, very rapidly, as 
fish consume a higher uh, quantity of feed. How quickly it drops? We have an estimation, and this is important. For example, here we had a lower visibility, but at the same time we had a steep decrease with increase of food quantity. This is not very nice. We prefer to have feeds that they have a sustained digestibility with change of feed quantity. With all these diagrams, we get this sort of information that, as you see later on, that can be very nicely correlated with in vivo studies. Another question. How much the digestibility of dietary protein changes when we have the appearance of stomach in larvae? Can you tell? Do you know any method? No. Here we have an example. This is European sea bass again, and we have a feed. Black line is what we call autohydrolysis. Autohydrolysis is you drop feed in the water and starts releasing nutrients. How much? What speed? Nobody knows. Here we have some, a measure. The green line is what happens early, 20 days post fast, before we have a fully functional stomach. As you can see, we have a lower digestibility, drops very quickly, and remains low with high uh, quantities of feed. What happens at 45 days when we have a stomach? We have a shift. Higher digestibility to start, and then drops, but still we have always higher, 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 higher rates, and then we reach a point of consumption, basically this is level of food consumption, that we have no difference between the functional and non-functional stomach. But here is the only way we have to tell the differences during digestive tract ontogenesis, how much the capacity for digestion changes. Okay? We have no other way so far to depict these changes. This is a nice assay that gives quite a lot of information as we can see later on. So what happens in this assay? It's called the pH start method and it's based on a very simple property of amino acids. <coughs> During digestion, we have the cleavage of a bond between two amino acids. And then we have the generation of an amino group and a carbo carboxy group by the proton exchange between the amino acids. This is their property. This is what they do. It doesn't matter if they are our proteins or somebody else's proteins, okay? This is an inherent property of the amino acids. So we take advantage of this inherent protein and then we add um, sodium hydroxide, sorry, and we tighten, tighten the amino group, and in this way, the volume of sodium hydroxide we use is proportional to the number of peptide bonds cleaved. And this is something we monitor in real time. We see happening there. It's not an end point, like we put in a jar uh, digestive enzymes, we put food, we shake, we wait, and at the end we measure something. No, it works in real time, and throughout, we can recall how many and at what speed we have the digestion of proteins because this is what happens in there. And we can do that. Katerina, it's, you're doing that in order to keep the pH stable. stable. That's why it's called pH stat. Okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this happens under very controlled conditions. And we can change the conditions. We can, we can try things around. And we can try things to simulate in an attempt to simulate what happens in vivo. That's the most important thing. Because in vivo, classes. In vivo, we have all sorts of different parameters that they affect digestion. Digestion is an interaction between enzymes and feed. Feed itself comes with some properties. What are the properties? The quantity digested, ingested, plus the autohydrolysis rate. Autohydrolysis rate is just a technical measurement, it's a technical protein. You write the recipe, you create the feed, and then has certain properties once it is released in the water. This is something that is, is, is completely technical, but helps a lot later on in the session. Enzyme activity levels now, it's very complicated. We have 
the impact of a series of biological factors, like the species, the states, the size, the age, but at the same time, all of this is moderated by pH and temperature. So we have three different categories, biological, abiotic, and the feed factors, that they all correlate there. They take the interplay to give us the final result of digestibility. Can we do that? Yes. We can change all this in this method. So we can have enzymes isolated by different species, by different developmental stages, different sizes. This can be done for adults as well, but this is not the point of this presentation, so we will stick to larval stages. We can change the pH, and we, we do that between 6 and 8 whenever we want, because this is the range we have in the digestive tract of the feet. Of the, of the fish. We can change the temperature easily. You run the acid between 15, 25 degrees, 30, whatever you pick. No problem, it responds very well. And at the same time, we can use different feeds and different quantities. We have different quantities in our acid, and this gives us a simulation of the consumption of the fish consumption, of the feed consumption by the fish. And the question is, we do all this, we have an optimized method. Is it true? Does it tell us the truth? And the only way to tell that is to couple in vitro with in vivo measurements. Again, with Bernacqua, in collaboration with Bernacqua, we ran two different tests, blind. We worked here for the in vitro measurements, and they worked there for the in vivo measurements. This is CBAS. Again, we have this X and Y. They are exactly the same experimental fish that we measured the digestive enzymes, and we had this correlation with survival and growth. And as you can see, <coughs> we had <coughs> they are both agglomerated diets, experimental formulas with high protein content. The feeding scheme is exactly the same like before. So we had two different. Experimental diet throughout, Artemia co-feeding diet, the most complicated scheme. What happened? In vivo results. Art, art X means co-feeding Artemia and X. Art Y, co-feeding Artemia and Y. X and Y, we are just feeding the experimental diet. <coughs> 30 days, we had <coughs> higher body weight for, uh, for Artemia X and then we had lower for Artemia Y, and we had the same pattern. So X was better than Y, even when it was fed on its own without the Artemia coffee. 45 days, so the result is that at 30 days, if we charge the feed at 30 days, we say that X is better than Y. Let's go to 45 days, exactly the same formula, and we have still a big fish, Artemia <coughs> and X, but we have a really big fish now. We had a huge difference between these two with Artemia white and Y. And also, we had an increased survival when we used Artemia and Y compared with Artemia and X. And at the end of the day, the total biomass was larger for Artemia Y compared with Artemia and X. So we say, as you can see here, they are more or less the same, they are competing very well. And at 45 days, we had the inverse picture, and X was worse than fit Y. Can you go back to see the, the dates? The dates. The dates. Diet. The, the dates. Yeah, nice. 46 and what is Y? Y is more protein. More protein, yes. Yeah. Okay, why is more protein? More protein. But that was not good for real estate. This didn't mean anything, mm -hmm. as you can see. And then it caught up with X at the later stage. This is the individual. Lots of numbers. Autohydrolysis is better for X compared with Y. Autohydrolysis means how much or how many amino acids and small peptides it releases on its own without 
any digestive enzymes. So that happens even if the fish does not have a digestive tract, just without the action of digestive enzymes. One, digestibility. We check 10 days and 20 days for the early stages. And at 10 days, X was better than Y. It's exactly the same like what happened with the, uh, the first measurements at 35 days with, uh, in, in the big experiment. 29 days, we have the appearance of the stomach, plus all the other plants. Inverts in in vitro. What happens here? X, X, 10, 29, Y, 10, Y, 29. The blue bit represents the autohydrolysis, okay, with increasing fish consumption. What's the difference? The difference is that between 10 and 29 days, for feed X, we have no difference in enzymatic hydrolysis. So basically, it's a feed that is not that well accepted by the digestive tract compared with what happens with X. Here we have, at the beginning, we have a small fraction of enzymatic hydrolysis, but look at this 20 and 29 days. So all this result in vivo has an explanation, and the explanation is that during maturation of the digestive tract, feed Y was better accepted compared with feed X. So even though this was a good feed at the early stages, it was not that good compared with Y at the later stages. And see, here you can see the difference. All this information is not available by any other method. This is our problem, and this is why we like it. So if we go for post-winning diets, these are commercial, for commercial diets, you see here, A, B, C, and D, and they were fed between days 60 and 120. It's again the same results you saw with the digestive enzymes. And if we rate the performance according to the final weight at 100 days post hats you can see that fit B is the winner, followed by C, D, and A. This is the in vivo. And this is what a hatchery manager would use for choosing, for picking uh, feed B plus value, of course, plus price. In vitro, more curves, the interpretation, autohydrolysis. B, higher autohydrolysis, this is advantage, if the fish does not have a very good digestive tract, still B supplies, gives more to, for absorbance compared with the others. C and D were more or less of the same, and A was the last one. Digestibility, B, C, A, D. So, if we go back, we had more or less the same rating. B, C, D, A, that was in vivo performance. In vitro, B, C, A, D for digestibility, but if you combine together this and this, the rating is the same. So again, we have B, C, D, and A for in vitro. This was very quick. The other one took tons, resources, feeds, and so on to get the same result, and this is the same number. So, we have a method to predict something, and this something is the performance of a given feed during larval stages. And we can differentiate between different stages using enzyme or using larvae to extract the digestive enzymes of different stages. We can differentiate between rare temperatures as well and species. So basically, we think that the, we can use it to compare commercial feeds in terms of autohydrolysis, digestibility, leaching, even leaching. You can leave this running for hours and hours, and you can see how much they release, what sort of leaching you have in your, in your feed. We can use it to evaluate experimental diets. We've done it in the first case, as you see. Or even to predict larvae performance. What is this now? Let's say that you have a feed and you have different batches of larvae. You can run the question the way round. What's that? I have four batches. Which one is going to respond better in this feed? 
perform better with a given feed. What you do, you actually digestive enzymes for all four patches, and then you run the digestibility with the same feed, but different digestive enzymes. And again, this will give you an idea how much the digestibility will be for each batch of larvae you have. And this is, is a very good measure of the digestibility performance of your larvae, or the batch of larvae. Are we doing okay? Any questions at this stage? Questions, heavy stuff, can we follow? Because we got, uh, you finished myosin. I'm, I'm almost there. You finished digestive and now you are I'm, I'm going to, to go <laughs> to the, uh, I don't know. This is the last part, okay? This yeah, is the chronology now. Yes. Any questions so far? So what we realized that the first stages, you need less protein, more phospholipids. I didn't say that. No. <laughs> 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 Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, so, what is the conclusion of the raw materials? Of the raw materials? The raw materials? I didn't say anything about the raw materials. Uh, that is, uh, to fight. We, okay. we can use the same, and we do the same for raw materials. And we have a very good rating for that. But there, you need a bit more of. Um, experience to interpret the results. Anyway, uh, I think that if you consider the biology, the early stages, you really need to choose And this is why you build cells. And cells have <coughs> membranes. And membranes are full of phospholipids. Okay? But very quickly after that, you have to be very careful, you need lots of proteins. Because After day 35, 29? No, 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 no. Very, From very early. Ah, very there are five days for scars already. Ah. Okay? We have a huge proliferation activity, all types of cells, and for that we need phospholipids to be the membranes of the cells. Okay? This is why there is such a need of high phospholipid content. And you're bothered how much, what type of phospholipid and so on I need for the early stages. Okay, there's a high demand for the cell membranes on that stage. But very quickly, these cells they start growing. They get bigger. And for that, you need less phospholipid, but more protein. Okay? Because you have still an increase in the surface of the cell membrane. More digestible protein. Yes, always digestible. Because it's not the... It's the same for phospholipids, but because phospholipids are easier and they cross the, um, the, 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 the digestive in, a, in an easier way, we're not so much bothered about digestive lipids. So you still need phospholipids, but you need lots of protein very, very early. What are you having? But, the, but the, the ratio should change, should be fine-tuned every, every two days, let's say, at this early stage. And when are you going to have the myosin indicator, the test? The test? We run already with, uh, with DS. And uh, we have some very good results. Okay. Now, can I ask something? Is there any way to activate earlier the enzymes or to increase the available uh, enzymes in the gut earlier? It doesn't mean, what do we need? We need more enzymes produced by the gut or more enzymes present in the gut? No, no, I mean, it's, you it's, can it's a different approach. Artificial, uh, I don't know. And you provide them. Yeah, you can. You can. And you need <coughs> to activate them. No. They activate the. Uh, well, it's, it's like this. All digestive enzymes are designed by nature to act outside the cell. Okay. So they are very resistant to all changes. You can dry them up and put them in the diet. Okay. And they are activated as soon as they are rehydrated and as soon as they are present in the digestive tract, what they need, a bit of trypsin. Trypsin is the activator that activates everybody down there. Is, it is something which is very expensive or? Uh... Well, I, uh, I think you need a company that produces enzyme to start and stabilizes enzymes. And then you need uh, the technology to put them in the diet. And for that, you don't like very much high heat processes. Ah. That's one way to do it. If you do that early, at the same time, you, have, you expect to have the activation of the internal production of digestive enzymes. 
What about this bacteria? You said that you had yes. some bacteria that yes. uh, they were producing enzymes. They produce very well, and they produce more resistant enzymes than the fish enzymes. So if we're going for a biotechnological uh, application, we would probably go for the bacterial proteases, but they act in the digestive tract of the fish instead of the fish proteases. But uh, bacteria, they produce lots of stuff. They produce so many amylases and carotases that they are never produced by the fish. And this is the most beneficial. So I, I really believe that bacteria enzyme profiles, they, they will be more helpful to formulate powerful diets compared with recombinant fish digestive enzymes. We have to continue because it's closing. Can I ask something else? Yeah. Uh, uh, the quantity of uh, the food may be increased the number of uh, bacteria, the, the microflora of the stomach, or not. Because no. in the nature, this must be stabilized. If you have a lot of protein and uh, phospholipids, maybe you have more uh, bacteria. Because the bacteria also feed by, by these things. You don't need lots of feed. Lot. You understand what I mean, lots? Yes, but, but uh, to my experience, feed quantity is not the factor that determines the establishment of bacteria microflora at the early stages. What is there the, is an inheritance the key, factor. The, the term key of uh, microflora. And the combination between bacteria strains, strains that we are present at the ah. same time there, and they compete for establishment in the digestive tract. This is the most important thing. If you had, let's say, coloration yeah. between uh, more feed and more bacteria that they produce enzymes, the digestibility, when you increase the feed, will be still retained. But uh, if you grow, if you see the curve, when you increase the feed, the digestibility goes down. So if there was another factor, the digestibility would be still up. Until one number goes like this, but after, of course, it's overfitting, you understand? Yeah. Yeah. And you can see what's over fish. I'm trying to understand what we can do to increase the microflora. Huh? Competition. Competition. Quality of the competition at the early stages. To start and feed comes later on. Oh dear. Just a bit. Just a bit. This is very quick now, okay? Huh? <laughs> 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 no. You won't. Yeah. Growth is under the control of growth hormone. Mm. Okay. Mm. This is something we know, and this is why we have fish genetically modified for growth hormone genes. Okay? This is why it's called growth hormone. However, growth hormone is produced by the pituitary, the hypophysi in the brain, released, and then it is absorbed with the help of, uh, of special receptors that they are in the surface of liver, of uh, liver cells. And then liver is, um, is stimulated to produce IGFs. IGF is insulin growth factor we have IGF-1, IGF-2. So liver is a central organ for the systemic regulation of growth through the production of uh, IGFs. IGFs, they are released in the bloodstream, but they are not just diluted, okay, running around. They are going around the body, bound in special carrier proteins. This is IGF binding proteins, this is what stands for. And in this form, they reach target tissues and they induce growth. This is what we call more or less somatotropic axis. This is a classical endocrinology of growth and simplified, okay? okay. Extremely simplified. Go for it. Γι' αυτό δεν γίνεται και ορμόνη, γιατί ακριβώς έχει όργανα στόχους, έτσι. Ναι. Αλλά, so we have different signals that they regulate the release of growth hormone and the production of IGFs, and these signals come from different origins. We'll see a more complicated scheme later on. And food nutrition 
and circulating insulin levels are, were the first factors that they were determined in this loop. The problem is that hormones are produced by the brain, but the brain is also developing during Hansen's stages. We have a developing digestive tract and we have a developing brain. So everything changes every single day during Hatchery stages. For developing example, uh, liver, eh? Developing liver is not so much. Uh, not no, so much. because we don't have the, the differentiation, that the level of differentiation that we have in other organs like the brain, for example. So here, this is CBAS again. You can see this is a small hypothesis, one day post hatch and this is areas that they produce growth hormone. They produce hormone that uh, releases later the, the thyroid, uh, regulates the thyroid hormones, let's stick to that. And you can see how it gets bigger and the producing areas, they change with age. So you can see, you expect that in every, and this is one, three, five, seven, you can see we, we have rapid and big dramatic changes so we expect a different regulation every single day during Hatchery stages. IGFs, plasma IGFs, they, they were shown to be significantly, significantly correlated with specific growth rates. So this is a paper, this is a publication that reviews information from different studies, if you want to go back and check it. And over there, we have correlations. And these were different fish, as you can see, different species that they were subjected to different feeding regimes, nutrient composition, temperature for the period, protein, and some with different genetic background, different strains. In all these cases, we had always a significant correlation of IGF circulating in the body, in the plasma, with the specific growth rate. So we have an indicator of how well, an endocrinological indicator, how well healthy larvae grow. And this is IGF. The problem is, can we measure it? We can. Can you afford to pay for it? You have to think about that. But if you can afford it, then you can have lots of extra information about the performance of your larvae and how well they are going to do at the end of your hatchery stages. Over the years, the network of growth hormone continuously expands and includes more and more molecules and peptides. And here we have a more complicated picture of the endocrinology. Again, we are here and we have the production of growth hormone that is directed to liver. Liver produces IGFs, one and two, and then we have target tissues, and as well gives information back to the brain if it's going to produce more growth hormone or not. But this is a very short loop comparing with what happens in the rest of the body. On this side, we have nutrition. And we have the stomach that uh, receives the food <coughs> and sends information through ghrelin to the brain. And also, we have adipocytes that they produce leptin. And leptin goes back to the brain and gives information there. And then we have growth hormone releasing factors that they stimulate the production of growth hormone. At the moment, there is lots of research going on about all these peptides you see here. And it looks like in the very recent years, uh, the, the, the years to come, we're going to have new assays based on this. There is lots going on on leptin and how leptin can predict and tell about the adiposity and the energy management of the body. So soon, I'm sure you're going to have this available for your larvae if you want to, to, to learn things. But already, we know a lot about um, CCK, holistokinini, lopoinica, and uh, neuropeptide Y, but they are very well co correlated with growth rates in different fish. But this is supposed to be very advanced. And one of the growth hormone release <coughs> peptides is the, the, the peptide that regulates the release of thyroid hormones by the thyroid glands. Thyroid hormones are very important. They are very important because they drive, and this is literal, 
they drive all the metamorphosis. During hatchery, thyroid hormones, they level up and they peak at metamorphosis and then they go down. They this is a wave, a hormonal wave, that leaves behind lots of dramatical changes. These levels, they are regulated by different enzymes that they build up the thyroid hormones and different receptors that they are in target tissues, okay, and they are there to accept the thyroid hormones and make the difference. Why do we want to know about that? Because thyroid hormones are very powerful morphogens, as we say, and we know very well that they affect the expression of structural genes, including mycelia HA2 and sibling and troponin T. So basically, we want to have a stabilized, a balanced, as much as possible, profile of thyroid hormones to achieve a good growth and normal growth of muscle that is going to be our final problem. And all this happens during hatchery stages. The importance of thyroid hormones and the powerfulness is depicted here, where we have transgenic coho salmon growth hormone. This is, again, has, uh, it is uh, genetically modified for growth hormone. And at the same time, this experiment, we have four different groups that one of these receives thyroid hormones. This one receives an agent that causes hypothyroidism, drops down the thyroid hormones. And this is the control that is not genetically <coughs> modified. What we can see here, we can see that we have an increase in production of growth hormone in fish that they combine transgenic plus supply of thyroid hormones. This is the transgenic control without any thyroid hormones. This is transgenic plus thyroid hormones, and you can see the difference. Total length, non-transgenic, hypothyroid, growth hormone plus uh, thyroid hormones, and compound. <coughs> Oh, no, it's, it's the opposite. I have it somewhere here. And also, we had an increase in food intake in fish that they administered thyroid hormone being transgenic at the same time. So thyroid hormones drive, can correlate, can um, interplay very well with growth hormone and drive the, uh, the growth rates very, very high. The problem is that we have to be very careful. There are different ways that we can induce higher, higher thyroid levels in our larvae. However, we have to be very careful because it's a potent morphogen. And this was evident in the same experiment where we had an increase in abnormalities, in skeletal abnormalities, an extensive overgrowth of the head and operculum in this fish that they were transgenic plus administered growth hormone. So it is not growth, yes. not growth hormone. Thyroid, administer, administer thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is going to be the indicator of the years to come, along with the carrier progress of thyroid hormone. We have already some results, confidential at the moment. I can give you just the conclusion. The conclusion is that there is a carrier protein for thyroid hormone, and the levels of this protein, they are tightly correlated with nutritional general nutritional status of the fish in Sibri at larval stages and adult stages at the same time. However, we have to be very careful how we are going to induce and how much we are going to induce the production of thyroid hormones and how we are going to manipulate the thyroidal status of our fish because we are on the margin where when we accelerate growth to that end, we might end up with an increase in skeletal abnormality. In another way, we probably change the pace between the development of muscle and skeletal. And over there, we end up with skeletal abnormalities, big piece, but abnormal. So if we want to conclude this, we have cumulative evidence that they suggest that growth hormone IGFs in their carrier proteins, appetite proteins like leptin and neuropeptide Y, are candidate endocrinological indicators of larval growth potential. Thyroid hormones are important players 
in fish ontogeny and they interplay with GOR hormone to affect the growth potential. And thyroid hormones and their carrier proteins could be examined, this is a mistake here, as potential endocrinological indicators of total larval quality. And to conclude, conclude, myogenesis, we see three different things. Myogenesis, digestive tract, and endocrinology. Myogenesis is the major procedure that builds the final aquaculture product, and I think we all agree to that, that's product. Early hatchery stages determine potential of massive growth and myogenesis markers can be used as larval quality indicators. So we can draw some quality indicators from that procedure. And going to digestive tract, this growth is fueled by nutrients available through the digestion. And we care for a quick maturation of the digestive apparatus, which can support a higher growth potential. And digestive enzyme activities and in vitro digestibility assays can be predictable of larvae quality and treatment performance. Finally, growth hormone, ICFs and thyroid hormones, their guided proteins are potential endocrinological indicators of total larval quality and nutritional status. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank questions. you, Katarina. If anybody has questions, Katarina uh, is here for a few or for two minutes, and <laughs> before she, she will. Except write. from uh, ad administration of uh, thyroidic uh, hormone, is it possible to increase to stimulate its uh, increase by adjusting the nutrition and how? Let's say that this is the case. from a general point of view. Yeah, th there is not a, think uh, there is not a recipe to give away to start, and uh, let's say that this is confidential information at the moment because it's, it's with a company, and we are not uh, allowed to release information. But yes, you can play around. But uh, I, I can I can answer you this question because we are 